All right. Welcome to the sixth episode of Building Excellence. Today I have Philippe Pereira in our multi-purpose studio slash office room. And uh, he's with Connecticut Property Management and um, looking forward to the conversation. Thanks for coming. Absolutely, man. Thank you uh, for having us out here. Uh, Canton is a nice little nook of Connecticut that I have not spent enough time in, as I told you before. Uh, certainly nice to be out here, though. Perfect day for a nice little ride. So looking forward to this. Me too, man. Thanks for uh, thanks for making the time. Absolutely. This uh, this whole podcast thing is like a new thing for us, and it's, I don't know, it's kind of fun, you know? Like you get in and have conversations, and you hear yourself in the, in the headset and all that, and it's just a different experience. Yeah, and I think it gives a great opportunity to hear other people's stories, and uh, there's always points of similarity, right. and then uh, just being able to hear what they did differently, and similarly, obviously, like I said, through uh, moments of struggle, because mm-hmm. <laughs> anybody who's self-employed, you're going to hit some stuff. Um, but yeah, man. Ups and downs. Stuff. Absolutely. So the crazy thing is, we had never met each other, and uh, right. I think, do you know uh, Jimmy McCard? Yes. So I think that's how we first connected because you had sent me a Facebook message like asking about a kitchen renovation or something yep. like, a couple months ago. And then um, that was before we had started this this podcast and all that. And uh, then I'm like friends with you on Facebook and I keep seeing like uh, all your posts about um, the property management company and stuff and then like your self-development stuff and some goals you're setting or something like that. And I was like, man, like that dude seems pretty driven. Like right on. It's definitely seems like somebody that should come out here and like we should have a conversation. So yeah, absolutely. Shout out to uh, my boy, Jimmy over there. <laughs> <laughs> How do you guys know? Each Canton other? native. Uh, so Jimmy and I met through bigger pockets, um, the uh, investors forum and, for landlords, property managers, realtors, the whole nine, anything related Definitely to real fan. estate. Yeah, bigger pockets is where it's at. It's what, what gave me my start. Um, but yeah, Jimmy and I met through the Manchester meetup. Okay. Um, boy, it must have been three or four years back. He's a car guy. I'm a car guy. One thing led to the next. He's actually a part of that uh, men's group that I was telling you nice. about earlier. So, yeah. That's sick, dude. Um, yeah, so I... I forget where I first met Jimmy. Probably at Midas. I know it might. <laughs> so I actually used to be a car guy too. Like, okay. uh, so back in high school, I had, I had an Audi as my first car and smashed it right into the telephone pole. And I was driving, uh, my parents neon okay. to like get around. And I was like, man, this thing's such a slug. Like I need to figure out how to make it faster, you know? And, um, got on the forums and like did a bunch of like stupid little bolt-ons and stuff like that. Like little cheap where we all start. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) And, uh, I ended up having like six neons over the time, time span that I was doing this. And the last one was pretty sick. It was a built motor roll cage in the chassis, like, um, cams, uh, so much custom stuff like intake manifold neons are like one of those like stupid cars that only really like neon lovers like get in there and i just kind of like happened to fall into it and want to make a fast car yep but my buddy had a very similar setup to mine and did like 12.1 at the track wow so it was like it was pretty it moved pretty quick Yeah. Yeah. yeah but um brad over there at midas is like I think he's the owner or like the general manager or something like that. He was really into neons and I needed to, uh, I needed it to get it to pass emissions one year. So I had to like unbolt the turbo, like do this whole, I had to have, I had a standalone like mega squirt uh, computer in there. Like, so it was like pretty modified and I had to get it back to stock basically to make it pass emissions. So they were helping me out. I'm sure that's probably where I met him first. Yeah. 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 Jimmy's a great guy. We've, I guess that we've kept touch or kept in touch uh, for years now. So that's cool, man. How did so you guys met at a uh, a meetup for Bigger Pockets? Um, did you you were telling me like your dad's a painter? Like you've been yep. kind of in real somewhat in the trades or real estate, like probably for your whole life um, in some aspect or another. Um, how did you specifically get into real estate investing and property management as an offshoot of that. Yeah. So it started actually, uh, 
back in college. So I always had a little bit of an entrepreneurial bug, uh, if I'll say myself. And going back to my passion for cars, uh, one day I saw like a, a car sticker and I mimicked it. And I'm from the Datsun Nissan world, 300ZX Turbo is where I got my start. And, nice. Uh, I posted these stickers for sale and everybody and their sister wanted one. And it was like, it was like $8 for a sticker. And like looking back and I'm like, Jesus, Philippe, like who are you <laughs> hustling for some stickers? <laughs> but it worked. And uh, one sticker became two, like design wise and two designs became four. And before I knew it, I had like a whole table of like 60 different designs that I was just selling out of my college dorm. Wow. Yeah. And I was like, <laughs> I don't know if Uncle Sam is going to like this, but I'm going to keep doing it until, yeah. you know, until I graduate no one knows. or whatever. Yeah. Nobody knows. So and like what hit me was I would go to bed and I would wake up and then my email would be like, so-and-so just bought $45 of stickers. <laughs> I'm like, holy hell. That's awesome. How else can I make money while sleeping? Right. And I think I Googled that, like my junior or senior year of college or going into my master's. And I Googled that and I'm like, how to make money while sleeping or like passive ways of making money. And like... Boom, bigger pockets on YouTube showed up like all their like passive income strategies. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, all right. Well, and then I remembered like when I was a kid, my parents had a three family in Hartford. Um, I can't remember the street, but it's relevant. They sold it because my sister and I got really active as kids, Portuguese school, sports, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, the whole nine. Yeah. So they sold it and they never did it again. But I was like, you know, my parents did this at one point. My grandmother, when she moved from Portugal, Lived in a three-family in Hartford. Lived on the first floor. Never made a mortgage payment because the tenants on the second and third floor, you know, the rent from Oh, that, she bought it. She bought it. She nice. lived in it. Yeah. She never moved anywhere else. She stayed in <laughs> Hartford the entire 40 years they were in the States before she moved back to Portugal. Uh, so, like I said, never made a mortgage payment because the rent was coming in covering that. Yeah. And uh, when she sold it, she got she kept all the money because there was no mortgage. So I was like, man. Hell, if it worked for them and they barely know a word of English, <laughs> surely I can do it with a double degree, right? Uh, and and that was it. I had the bug. So four months after I graduated, I bought my first four family. Nice. In East Hartford. Um, much to my uh, parents' chagrin, because I was I was dating or engaged to a girl at the time. And uh, they're like, well, just, just wait until you get married. Buy your single family first. <laughs> then worry about get investing. Yeah, get set up. Backwards. You know. <laughs> exactly. I'm like, no, nah, I'm going to do this. And I did it. And I bought a place was 200,000. It was bringing in like 3,600 bucks a month. I was like, this works. Right. And I started looking at my, my paycheck at work where I was working 160 hours a month. And I looked at my net uh, income for my four family that I was working at like four hours a month. <laughs> and I was like, one of these is not like the other in terms of effort per or dollar per effort. Right. And, uh, I was like, well, I got to do more of this. And then I realized, you know, if I can be a landlord for myself, I can probably be a landlord for others. And just by listening to enough of the Bigger Pockets podcast, I knew that a property manager can make or break any kind of real estate transaction that requires management, obviously. And I knew I had the strong enough ethics that I could run books and that I was personal and com communicate clearly. And I just went for it. So I got my real estate license in sometime 2017. I, uh, Bought another house, a single family over in Windsor Locks. And then uh, two weeks after I closed on the house, I put in my notice just nice. to make sure I had the, the mortgage paperwork <laughs> squared away because I was dependent on that W-2 right. to be able to buy the house. So as, as soon, soon as you as, go off on your own, it's like you need two years. Oh, yeah. And, you know, it might not be enough sometimes. And right. not to mention, like, the income levels and all that. And so as soon as I closed pretty much, I put in my notice and then went full time. Full-time real estate, so. So what year did you buy the four family? 2016. 2016. 23. Nice, dude. Yeah. Congrats. I love that. It, was, <laughs> it changed my life forever. Hell yeah. I tell every, I got cousins who are 20, 19, 18, 21. I tell them, start looking. Start figuring out how you're going to do that first one. Dude, with an FHA loan, it's like a no-brainer. Absolutely. Like put 3% down. Yeah. Most kids that do that are putting it down on a single family for them to live in, but you do it on a multi and then... Like I had, so I bought one in when I was 24 yep. in 2014, two family in Bristol, used my FHA, did a two or three K loan. Buddy of mine was the con the contractor and I ended up doing most of the work oh, myself. Yeah. Yep. And it was like 
I shot myself in the foot because my wife and I did it together. So we both used our first time oh, home buyer. I got you. But at the same time, like I'll tell everyone now, like keep those things separate, like buy one, right. one or the other and use that. And you can get into a house like with almost no money. It's, it's insane. And like, as long as you're okay with that amount of like leveraging, I highly recommend it. Me yeah. personally, like I wasn't totally comfortable with, with that. So I did. I think I did 20% down on, right. on my four family. And it's like, well, obviously because I was in a financial position to be able to do that, I did that because that's what I'm, I'm comfortable with. But yeah, absolutely. If you, I mean, FHA makes a lot of sense. It just makes sure you refi out of it if you got a high exactly. rate. And not to mention the, the MIP. What's the MIP? Uh, so FHA requires MIP, which is mortgage insurance premium. Oh, right. Um, oh, not a conventional loan that you do less than 20% down. That's when you get PMI. PMI, yeah. yeah. MIP, That's what I'm familiar with is the yeah, PMI. Yeah, PMI is cheaper than uh, the FHA version, which is MIP. Gotcha. Yeah. I forget, like, all the details we did. We did refinance out of it. Good, and this and that, good, but good. It's definitely a, uh, it's definitely a thing. Um, so, how, so, like, you wanted to do, like, the whole passive income thing and make money while you sleep. How exactly did that transpire? It, like, what were some ups and downs with the four family that you had that made you feel comfortable with, like, sure. going off and getting into the property management and quitting your job? Yeah, so I think property management started off as a means to an end. I I was dead set on not working for somebody else. Mm. Um, and getting my real estate license, uh, you eat what you kill. Yeah. <laughs> so... Uh, but at the same time, it gives you immense freedom and you get to control your schedule. And that was important to me when I'm, when you're working for the man, quote unquote, uh, you don't get that. You right. show up when they tell you to show up and you leave when, when you're allowed to leave pretty much. Um, so I saw property management as an avenue to become self-employed. Mm. Uh, so it wasn't so much that I had the confidence to do it. It was more so like come hell or high water, I'm going to do it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, sometimes Back against the wall. Yeah, too. exactly. Because like I saw no other way out and like I wasn't going to sell stickers full time. I, I had I hustled enough <laughs> out of those people that like, you know, I was hitting every car group like Toyotas, Hondas, <laughs> Nissans, everything, anything that had like a cult like following. I was hitting them and uh, T-shirts, sweatshirts, everything. But uh, all was, the swag, all the swag. <laughs> um but, I, you know, I knew that wasn't something I want to do long term. And it's like there's there's no passiveness to that. Whereas like property management is different than being a uh, agent because we, we function on 12 month contracts. Mm. When you're a real estate agent, it's you better kill the next one so that you can eat next month. And it's like, OK, well, then once you do that one, you got to find your next lead and then your next lead and your next lead. And it's like in property management, as long as we're doing a good job. And of course, our clients don't sell the properties. They're right. going to keep us. So it's like, okay, <laughs> oh, just get the client once. And then once you get the client once, you keep them for, for as long as you want or until they sell the property. And most people are, are buying property for cash flow, or at least, excuse me, most people that we're working with are buying a property for cash flow. It's like, okay, so why would they want to sell it if, right. if the property is producing? It's if it's cash flowing and if they're happy with us, they're not going to fire us and they're not going to sell it. So, like, once you get that client once, that could potentially be a four, five, six, seven, eight year client, depending on, on how Plus, if they go. get more. Exactly. Right. That relationship is now, like, so when people, and it's like, that's transferring over to, like, marketing now, where it's like, people often talk about cost per lead. It's like, you can afford to spend a lot per lead in property management, as long as these people are staying with you for years and years and years. Whereas, like, in your business, I imagine, like, you have to be careful with that cost per lead, because one project now sure they might hire you for another project next year or two years from now or they might tell their best friend but it's it's very much that like you need to get that job and then once you get that job you need to get your next job because that first job is no longer paying you once right. you're done with it if you even get the job <laughs> <laughs> small caveat there right yeah let me put a big old asterisk yeah Exactly. Dude, that's the biggest. So like uh that's the I want to get back into sure. property management in a minute but that's like the one of the biggest things like when I first started was all these companies would be hounding me to try to get me to buy leads from them, like home advisor, Angie's list house. Uh, you, there's a couple other ones, sure. but um, all of the same mentality, like, Hey, we'll send you as many leads as you want. It's $50 per lead or $30 yeah. per lead or whatever. Well, that adds up really quick. Like we can get, um, 
you can get 50 leads in a day and you won't be able to service all those people. But what is that? Uh, 2,500 bucks. You know what I mean? So never went with any of that. Like for me, it was always like, I have a fairly like savvy, uh, I would say like financial backing background. Sure. Um, so it never really made sense because I'm like, yeah, I can pay for this lead, give this guy a quote or run out and look at the job. Cause back then I went and looked at every single job and give this guy a quote. And then he's like, Oh, well you're too high. Or you don't seem like he's not going to tell you. They almost never tell you this, even if you ask them, but like, you don't seem like you're confident in what you can do. Or I didn't like your vibe of like you walking on my property or I looked you up on Facebook and I don't like your political views or oh, whatever. Isn't crazy? You know what I mean? Isn't like, it crazy? People can like, quote unquote, qualify you in so many ways these days without yeah. you even stepping on the property. So with that being said, like these pay for lead things and guys are, I see guys online, like on Facebook, like promoting their own pay per lead sites, like referral source sites or whatever. And it's just, it doesn't really make sense for us. I'm much more about like, building the relationships, building the brand, brand awareness than having to pay someone for the leads. Because for me, it's like the goal with starting this company was to do something, make a place where guys that work in construction could have fun at work and like have a great work environment and make a place where you're delivering an excellent experience to the clients that we're working for, which I wasn't seeing that happen in the places that I worked, you know, like, yeah, every, every client, like say, say there's five people that want a bathroom project done and they hire five different contractors. Like most of the time, the contractors focus on getting that job done to like get paid for the, for the job. And if he's been in business for a long time, you're probably going to get some quality work out of that, but it's not anything about, uh, <laughs> no worries. I specifically turned that thing off. How is it? <laughs> no worries. In your headset? Yeah, when I'm talking, like, um, there's times where it cuts in and out. I you, wasn't sure if that was like like my pauses. It definitely has to do with like how far away okay. you are from the mic. All right, let me just lower readjust this. I was trying bit. to like look at you and I'm like looking through this thing. <laughs> yeah, just do a little readjustment. Yeah. But what I was saying is... Um, the a lot of the contractors that I was working with they're all that older generation like we were talking about before we got on the recording and um, they might not have the ex the whole experience in mind for the client as much as just like doing what they think is a good job so for us like how can we make it better like how can we make the experience better you know like well we live in the age of um, where you go on Amazon and you order something and it comes the next day, most people don't get back to their clients with estimates for a while, you know, or mm -hmm. you set the appointment. Typically, this is how it works. You know, you call a contractor. Hey, can you come give me an estimate for a job? Contractor says, yeah, let me look at my schedule for when I can get out there to look at it. Maybe that's next week. So then next week he goes out there, talks to you, tells you when he can get it an estimate written up for you to get it back. Cause this is how I used to do it. Cause yep. I thought how I thought that's how it had to be or how it was supposed to be, you know? Um, but so like for my story, like I used to do that and I was getting to the point where I was doing like 30 estimates a week and on top of working in the field. So like I'd go look at a couple in the morning, sure. go at lunchtime, then go back to the job site and then go in at night, do a couple more. And then have to type them all up. I'd take a bunch of pictures while I'm out there to remember because, like, you're running from back and forth from all these different things. Unless you, like, take the pictures and the notes, you don't really remember all the details, you know? Right. So um, I was like, I'm taking these pictures anyway. If I Everyone has a smartphone. And I was listening to a lot of podcasts and, like, doing research online, sure. too. To, like, how do I make this better, you know? Like, trying to educate myself. But everyone has a smartphone today with access unlimited data most of the time you know what i mean just ask the clients to take pictures of what they want to do and yep. send them to you and get a description of what they want hey i want to remodel this bathroom and i want to put tile floor on the ground i want to do a tub with a tile surround i want to put a double vanity in there's a single vanity there 
Well, you don't, you're not going to see any more of the job than what you see in the photo when you're there. You're not opening walls. You're not doing anything. So, Absolutely. And then what I was doing is I'd look at the pictures that I took and I'd sit there in my, op- my home office at the time and like figure out, okay, it's going to take me X amount of days to do this, X amount of days to do this, X amount of days to do this. And it just like, I don't know, not to mention you're driving around to say 30 different places in one week and maybe getting like two to five of the jobs that like right. say they want to move forward with you. So like, how can we make that process way more efficient? Have people send their information in. We direct all, there's so many ways people contact can contact you today, direct yeah. all of them to one spot. And, um, you can pull from that spot as you have time and get people an estimate back within a day. If we have time, like in our schedule, you sure. know, someone could email today. If we're all caught up with the people before them, back we on. can get back to them that day. Yeah. Um, I, I mean, forget exactly where I was going. With no, that, no, that's fine. Let me jump in here. Um, so just from what I see online, I think you're, you're, you're hitting your target in terms of like, you want ZN construction to be a place where, uh, contractors and builders can come and and like actually have fun. Because the reason I say that from the outside looking in, it looks like you're killing it is because I get that vibe from, from the stuff you guys post, Yeah, which, you know, like it's one thing to, to tell someone face to face, like, Hey, this is what we're doing. But right. it's another thing when there's consistency behind it. When, right. When like, you don't know who's watching. Like I didn't know you were watching my <laughs> stuff on Facebook. And like, that's just how Facebook only tells you like, Oh, a hundred people saw your post. They didn't tell you which people saw your exactly. post. So like, you don't know who's reading it. Right. Um, so kudos to you. First of all, uh, second of all, also in my business, like I'm starting like COVID helped more than it hurt us at least yeah which is ironic because you know of all the eviction moratoriums and all that stuff that didn't hurt us what helped us though was people now like i hate to say this but i used it as an excuse like hey you know because of covid we're really not trying to look go into people's homes can you send us a video or can you have your tenant send us a video because we pre-qual everybody pre-qualify everybody in terms of potential clients right because like we don't want that house where you have to walk through three bedrooms to get to the fourth bedroom that's just weird and it's like (laughs) weird properties attract weird tenants and weird tenants turn into problem tenants most of the time um so we started saying hey send us a video send send me a a google drive link an icloud link whatever a google drive link there's so many options send me a video of of the layout just go around with your phone you know show me the size of the closet show me the size of bedrooms the bathrooms you know the overall condition and from that nine out of ten times we can make a decision like if nothing else to make the decision to like dig in deeper for sure because you know like the first uh qualifier is like where is it okay the second qualifier is like okay what's the client like because we're not a fit for everybody and not everybody's a fit for us it's just for reality sure. of business, right? Like for every one unit we'll take on, we might say no to three or four others. And I'm okay with that. Like I'm not a volumes guy. I'm, yeah, I'm yeah. all about the quality. Uh, it allows us to have the success that we have, I think. Um, so thank you to COVID. Uh, for sure. To, to, to just somewhat force us, but also to make it socially okay, right? Because right there, you're going to tell you, you're going to figure out what kind of cl- person you're dealing with in terms of like, their aptitude to do things in a non-conventional way. And sometimes that's important for sure because like you want that client that like bends and flexes with you mm-hmm. versus like their way or the highway, because usually again, asterisks there, but usually the ones who don't bend and, and they're going to be hard to work. going to be hard to work with. For sure. Exactly. And they're going to call out every single, like you charge me what for that screw, like <laughs> whatever home Depot ch- or whatever the supply yard charge, like, you know, plus whatever our standard markup is. Um, and then in property management, it's like uh, your plumber charged me what? And it's like, I mean, we're, yeah. work, we're working with the best people with the best prices. Like we're not right. working with the cheapest guys because <laughs> there's problems with those guys too. You want to have to have them come out two more times. Exactly. <laughs> so it's like, yeah. It, and you can kind of get a sense real quick where it's like, you know, if it's their way or the highway, it's probably, probably not the ideal client. I totally I kind of love that we got onto this little tangent because yeah. I haven't, I, it's something that I hadn't really thought about for a while, but I did think about, I wanted to do a whole video just about like the online estimating process and, and that sort of thing. And it really ties into COVID because for us, like we started doing this in 2018 where we would have clients send pictures, send information, the whole nine yards. 
And at first it was like a lot of pushback, but then it got to the point where a lot of people would do it, but some people would not. And just like you were saying about kind of like weeding them out, yeah, it weeded them right exactly. out. And like you realize these people who are not willing to like take 20 minutes out of their day. Right. Oh, well, every other contractor comes out to our house exactly. or every other property management guy just comes out and meets me. Like, Preach it. so those people are not someone who you really want to work with anyway, because they're hard people to work with. They want it their way. They want it. And yep. they're not willing to give you that like respect. And that was something that I was learning a lot at the time through the podcast I was listening to is like, you want to, you're a professional. So like you want that respect from the client as much as you want to give the respect to the client. Totally. And um, for us, that happened to like really work out in our favor as we came into COVID. Cause it's like, yeah, we've been doing this this way for, for a couple of years now. You know what I, mean? like, <laughs> I love it. We don't need to come yeah. into your house because yeah. people would email us. They're like, I know with yeah. I don't really want you to come in. Can you still give me a quote? Right. Like, yeah, no problem. Just right. send us the pictures and whatever, and we're good to go. We've been touch free since 2018, <laughs> baby. <laughs> but I think honestly, like to your point with like COVID kind of making that a way for you, like I honestly, and I would tell people this too, especially other contractors, but it works for so many different situations. Like this is how everyone should do it because it's honestly less time. Like, you look at it from a client's point of view or a property owner's point of view, they have to take time out of their schedule to go and walk you through the property, talk to you. It's not going to take any less than half an hour. And your competitors. And your so competitors. So you're meeting with yeah. multiple people to come down here. Yep. Very similar for us. Like right. People have to make time out of their schedule to show the contractor, like, hey, this is the room I want remodeled. Yeah. So, yeah, you're going to make hours out of your schedule anyway to meet with all these people just take 20 minutes just and take the link. photos and send them an email that's literally going to take like 20 to 30 minutes to type up here's my contact information here's what i want done and we're going to send you a really nice email back because it's not like a phone conversation and you need that kind of like um connection right. with the client you know what i mean yep so we put a lot of time into that but you're going to get your numbers which is nine times out of ten what people are looking to get up front anyway like very quickly and then you can make your decision like okay like did these guys really meet my standards of who i want to hire and right. who i want to work with for this project or not and move on to the next one if not yeah not only is it a great way to qualify people and like quote unquote weed people out but it also gives you um the ability to kind of figure out who actually wants to work with you mm. versus who is just window shopping and who would work with anybody right because right. Like, if you make the process a, a little bit harder which you know given 2021 sending photos through your phone is not that much harder but it's enough that like some people are going like, to oh, screw that i'll just call the next guy right <laughs> and what does that mean that means they were never really invested with working with zn construction they right. were invested in well let's call 15 guys and see who gets back to me right how many guys time can we waste for this? It, exactly <laughs> and it's like same thing with like the property management like i really only strive to work with people who want to work with me right because there's thousands of rental units across just Hartford County alone. Right. Yeah, yeah. So it's like by the time people call us and I say this as humbly as, as humanly possible. Right. Please, you know, don't, don't, don't judge, <laughs> don't judge me. But like <laughs> by the time people call us, they already know like the service level that they're going to get. They, yeah. they know who who's doing what, and they have a pretty good feeling like th this, this has a real viability. Mm. Right. And that's important because we're not like throwing 15 hooks in the water trying to get one client. We want our ratios to be one to one. Right, <laughs> you know, right. you call, we want to hire, you know, we want to make it work. Um, so much less, so much less wasted time. Oh yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And like the people who will want to earn, who do want to work with you will do that. They're like, Oh yeah, sure. No problem. The only caveat I think there is out there is like that older clientele. Right. So it's like, you know, that 60, 70 year old, not who, really tech savvy, not really tech savvy. Right. So it's like, what have you done in that? Because, like, I know this area of Connecticut has, for lack of better terms, pretty good money. For sure. The, the demographic, right? And uh, I'd imagine there's a lot of retirees that come out here, buy a house, and they want to change something. Super affluent area. Yeah, that, that's the term. <laughs> thank you. See? See, look at that. You're We're helping each other out here. Yeah, yeah thank you. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so it's... Uh, How do you get over that with that older clientele? Honestly, like... It really depends okay. because sometimes you find that people who are older 
may not seem like the person that you want to work with anyway because you tell yeah. them the process and they're like, well, screw that. Yeah. You know what I mean? But I have found that now... So like it's all about building relationships and um, and also building up your brand too. But I have so that early on, like that was kind of how we would how it would come across is like, oh, you want us to do X, Y, and Z? Like I'm not really into that. Right. Like you can't just come out here. Well, yeah, we can come out. But it's a consultation fee, and it gets credited back to you if you move forward with us. Like the whole nine yards. Smart. And um, in terms of like how do we deal with it, I don't know that I have like a perfect answer for you because every person's going to be a little bit different. Sure. But I do know that like the majority of our business that we get now is off over Facebook and it has been for a long okay. time. And a lot of the older generation is on Facebook and like still can reach out that way and they can call our main number. They'll talk to Suzanne. She'll like walk them through the process. Sure. And if they really have a problem with it, like she'll try to help them and, or work. like set, make something happen. Yeah. Maybe we'll just go out there and look at it if it's close by or something like that. Sure. But a lot of times now, People, this is why I was saying like it's important to build the relationships and the and the brand because people will see online like we have a really good presence and that's by design, but <laughs> they'll see that and they'll be like just like you were saying like you want those people who want to who already know they want to work with exactly. you exactly same thing for us they'll see that really good online presence and the reviews and the whole nine yards the pictures the videos. And they'll be like, wow, like these are the guys that I want to do my work and they'll jump through the extra hoops or they'll talk to, they'll, they'll figure it out on their end as much as we have to figure it out on ours. Totally. I haven't found, or I haven't found, uh, anyone who really wanted to work with us that the online process yeah. completely turned them off. That, you know that makes I mean? perfect sense. And you know what? You're really just setting yourself up for the future pretty darn well here because, you know, those the 60 year olds in 10 years are 50 now. And if right. you're 50 now, you have a smartphone most right. likely, you know, this, the, the question really that I asked probably only applies to a very small percentage of like folks who are above 60, maybe above 70 at this it's point. It's tough, dude. I mean, there are some old, we have the majority of people that we work for are, are usually between like 25 and 60. Okay. Probably somewhere in there. Yeah, so you're okay for the most part. We're okay with that aspect. But there are some older clients who are not tech savvy or something like that. And we have worked with them. And it works out usually. But I'm sure that there's others that... I, in fact, I know that there's others. Because um, that older generation is reading the newspaper. They're reading the uh, clipper flyers that yep. come in, you know. Yep. And there's a lot of contractors that pay big money to be in those things. And those guys are still cranking, you mm -hmm. know what I mean? So their demographic may be that older generation. And that's just kind of how it, how it goes, you know, but those guys are better. They're going to have to figure something out here in the next few years because well, they're, they're all getting older too. Oh, and you think they'll just phase out of the business. You mean it's hard to say, but like yeah. I feel, I personally feel that way. Like yeah, you're, that makes sense. You can't do it forever. And right. a lot of these guys, like if you haven't built, I also say this like in the most humble way possible and it's really all because of the guys that we have on our team. But if you haven't built a team and have systems in place to be able to have the business run, like dude, eventually it just gets like, it drags on you. You know what I mean? Like it wears you down. Like this yes, industry, sir. the last, I was talking to Steve, one of our other guys, Steve on the last podcast. And like, we we're joking that like this industry just like chews you up and spits you out because like, if you're a one man show or like you've always run your own company or something, you're running every single job. You're either in the field swinging the hammer or your fingers on the pulse, like heavy all the time. You know what I mean? Yeah. The amount of stress that you have to deal with is insane. And there's Crazy. no balance. It's funny you mentioned that because, and it's so unfortunate that like the typical consumer doesn't quite grasp that the, let's just call it CEO, but not like, Wall Street yeah, yeah. CEO, but like the owner of the company. Like, right. Yeah, let's call that. The owner of the company shouldn't probably, probably shouldn't be out there swinging the hammer next to his his guys. And it's like, it hurts me to say that because like, I would love to be out in the field every day. Not going to happen. Like I got, <laughs> I got clients to manage, right? Yeah, yeah. Whereas like, you know, the handyman task should be handed off to the handyman and the plumbing task should be handed off to the plumber. And I should not be changing locks, even though right. I'm perfectly capable of changing locks, right? Um, 
so going back to my mother, my parents are having their, their driveway stripped and uh, repaved currently. Yeah. And my mom was like, you know, it was so great to see the owner of the company out there with his guys. You know, I was, <laughs> I was so impressed with him. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, he's not doing it right. Like, well, they see that and they're like, they get that feeling of pride or, or that like, they know that the quality is going to be the best that it can be. Right. But dude, I'll be the first one to tell you, like, I love, I, I mean, I, I have a love for carpentry and I love doing it right and right. giving a good product, but there are times where like, I should not be in the field and I'm usually not at this point, but like, there's been times in our whole growth cycle and like through the company, like you're always like expanding, contracting, sure. like grow, like figuring things out, you know? where I've been in the field, but you have all this head garbage up here and mm -hmm. like stuff you're trying to remember and stuff. And your focus is not on. Exactly. It's just that's how that accidents job happen. Done. That's how yeah. accidents happen. And, and things accidents or pro right. quality work, like either one. Right, right, right. So yeah, it's unfortunate that like the average consumer probably doesn't quite like understand that the owner shouldn't be on the job, but hey, we're not just there how as it a society is. yet. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We need more self-employed people to, to like really understand it, I think. And stuff. That's another reason why I love this kind of atmosphere for this conversation, because it's a way to like get that out there of like right. what really goes on. Cause most people don't know. Another yeah. thing me and Steve were joking about last time is like, if, <laughs> if the average person knew like the stuff that we have to go through and like the stress that you're under to like get these products done or, in your aspect like i have tenants of my own like change out like from one tenant to the next one yep. and like filter through these people or deal with a tenant that's not paying rent like the amount of stress that people are under is incredible and most people all they see is the surface or the face of the face value of like whatever that person's doing yeah i've always said that the irony of being self-employed was that i thought the most stressful thing would be like taxes or actually running the business and it turned out for like the first year and a half the most stressful thing was like going on vacation <laughs> <laughs> it's like they don't tell you that part but like seriously because like the locomotive still has to run while you're not at the front of it right so if it ain't you then it's who yeah you know, right. or then who right so and what problems are you having to deal with or that are happening you're trying to get done before you leave. Exactly. You might not quite get them all the way done. And then like, what's going to happen? Like uh -huh. while you're gone. Or like you're driving to wherever you're trying to get to. And uh, your significant other is right there looking at you like, what the hell are you doing on your phone right now? And it's like, oh, I just got to get this last email out. <laughs> it's like. You can't yeah. shut off the head if it's not like fully clear. Oh God, it's awful. That was, that was definitely the one thing that caught me by surprise. I'm like, yeah, no, taxes will be the hard part. And trust me, taxes are awful and I hate taxes, but going on vacation the first couple of years was, was the, the toughest. So you, um, you had started this thing in what, 2017? Yeah, I started in 2017 and then went full time in 2018. So do you have like, where's the company now? Like, do you guys have, do you have a team in place or at all? Or so you're it's, still running most of it? I'm running most of it. Uh, I work primarily out of a home office. Uh, I love my home office. Nice. <laughs> There's just like peace and quiet. And it's like, <laughs> don't have the overhead of having a physical office. Um, and it gives me maximum flexibility. For sure. Right? Because it's like, there's no team meetings on Monday at 7 a.m. Yeah, or, yeah. or whatever. Uh, and like I said, the root of going this way was to be able to get complete control of my schedule. Mm. So if, if I can have uh, as many things fluid and not fixed as possible, the better. Because right. that, again, that, that gives me what I want, which is flexibility, like complete ownership of my schedule. Obviously things have to get scheduled, meetings have to happen. Et cetera, et cetera. So you can put them what makes sense for you. Exactly. Exactly. So, so yeah, it's primarily myself. Got a couple of assistants that help on an as needed basis. Like there's, there's tougher times of the year in terms of like uh, May through August is our heavy leasing season. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's not uncommon that we might be doing 20, 30 lease renewals, 20, 30 vacant season in a couple months. And I get it for some people that sounds like a lot. And for some people that's peanuts. That's yeah, cool. Yeah. That's where we are right now. So <laughs> bear with me here. But, uh, you know, times like that might bring on somebody to help with, you know, getting all those lease renewals out the door and on time and, and maximizing the rents for, for our clients. And uh, But, you know, come Christmas, there's not much happening in property it's management easier. except for repairs, right? right? Because, like, nobody, we don't have leases coming due between October, really, and, like, March. Because Is that just because of the cold or... 
Well, it's it's planned because like nobody wants to move the like let's two weeks before Thanksgiving. Who wants to move? Nobody. Then you got Thanksgiving. Then it's like okay, you're hungover from Thanksgiving. Oh, craziness! Christmas is in two weeks, even <laughs> though everybody's known Christmas is like three weeks or four weeks after Thanksgiving. Yeah, nope. Yeah. So nobody's gonna move before Christmas. Then guess what? New Year's. Nobody's moving during New Year's. Everybody's broke. So then it's like oh then January. Winter. Then we got like three snowstorms in a week. Nobody's right. moving through that. So it's like by the time you actually like get through it all, it's like okay. March and then it's like oh tax season oh cool I got some money let's look into moving right so we really like hell focus on getting leases from May to like at the latest September October mm. um, because like we want to set ourselves up for success hell we'll do a 14 month or 16 month lease if it means that we end up in May not January <laughs> so you guys don't have to deal with that like yeah, someone so that, moving out, someone moving in. Ex- well, that and it minimizes the vacancy because it's a lot easier to fill a unit during tax season or right after school's out than it is, you know, Christmas, New Year's, January, that kind of thing. Gotcha. You can see like the level of interest just change as the weather huh. changes. So just so not everyone listening to this probably fully understands like what sure. do you do. So like, could you tell me in a nutshell like what you do? as a property manager and then totally. like what that looks like for a client. Yeah. And I probably should have led up with that. So <laughs> my <laughs> bad good. on that one. Uh, so I always tell people that call us, uh, we're essentially landlord for hires. Okay. Uh, anything you would have to do, let's just pretend like you didn't know how to swing a hammer. You didn't know how to change a plumbing fixture. You didn't know how to do any of the things that sometimes to take care of a house. Uh, you, exactly. So you would, let's pretend like you would have to hire it all out. So we take that process and that workload off of your shoulders and handle it ourselves. So A to Z property management. If you need a guy to mow the lawn, we got a guy to mow the lawn. If you need a guy to fix a toilet, we got a guy to fix a toilet. If you need uh, a faulty GFCI outlet replaced, we got a guy for that. And it's not people that, you know, we have on our, our, you know, W2 payroll right. team, but local we've got, professionals. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Licensed professionals who, who give us a discount on the price given, you know, the you're going to get more. Mow. Exactly. Yeah. So, um, Anything related to that property, we can handle top to bottom. And some clients think that's awesome. And they're like, shoot me an email once Take a month. Take everything. Tell me how much I made. And other than that, I don't want to hear from you, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know, in a polite way, of course. But other clients like, yeah, I want to review the tenant applications before we choose a tenant. It's like, cool, whatever. You know, we're at the we're at the size that we can be flexible to, to whatever that person's needs are. Right. So. Um, and then we charge a, a fee based on, on the rent. It's a, it's a percentage fee. So if, if you've got a higher quality tenants at, you know, a higher rent price versus like, you know, the North end of Hartford, it's going to be different. Yeah. It's going to be a little cheaper. But you're also making a little bit more money on the nicer units with nicer tenants. So, yeah. 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 Um, so does that like, so say someone has a single family house that they're renting sure and they call you up and they want you to manage that for them the house is vacant right now Mm -hmm. like what would happen so like they'd start paying their fees like each month no so they don't they we only make money when the client is making money so if there's no rent coming in we're not making any money right why because we really see this as a partnership Mm -hmm. if you're being successful we should be successful if you're losing your share on this property you know Aside from like, if you chose a bad property, (laughs) we're not going to take that one. But, but like, you know, if you have a tenant in place and therefore you're, you're cash flowing, then that's when, okay, property management fee makes sense. But companies who charge, and I'm going to try to avoid this soapbox and this tangent (laughs) as best I can, I'll keep it to 10 seconds or less, but property management companies who charge a flat fee, whether or not the unit is rented, I think there's a huge conflict of interest there because what, what, uh, motivator do i have to rent the unit guess what an empty unit isn't calling me to tell me something broke so right. why wouldn't i keep that unit empty right so by charging only when the unit is rented and therefore money coming into you the property well, you're owner, really just going to make the property owner mad right like oh i keep paying you like where's the tenant that you're supposed right to be putting in this right place? exactly and i think it just i think it creates a, a, a faulty relationship from the beginning like mm-hmm. this is supposed to be a partnership like i'm watching out for your potentially four or five hundred thousand dollar investment right you shouldn't have to be thinking in the back of your head is Philippe doing everything he can, you know, are they getting the best rates? Like you should be able to trust me fully. And, and like, if I'm charging you to have your unit empty, yeah, I yeah. think that just, that's a, like a breeding ground for like distrust and like, 
you know, questioning, are we doing the best we possibly can? So for sure. I, I think it's a conflict of interest. Anyways, uh, <laughs> I tried the 10 seconds. It didn't work. Yeah, yeah, exactly. um, but yes, so uh, we can handle everything from the beginning. And at this point, I've already forgotten your question and I apologize, but, um, no, I was just saying to like walk us through. Like, oh, right. What, uh, okay. From the beginning. Yeah. So let's say, uh, Joe calls us, says, Hey, we got one, two, three main street. Uh, it's empty right now. We'd like to get it rented. So, you know, in COVID times, we'd say send the video, whatever. But if it's the local one, we'll we'll swing by. We'll take a look at it and say, hey, you know, here's what we think it'll rent for now. But if you do X, Y, Z, you know, paint the place, change the carpets out to LVP, uh, you know, update the bathroom, whatever, whatever we yeah, come yeah. across, we think you can get X. Um, and then it's up to them. If they want to do those things, awesome. If they don't, you know, to be honest, if the place is too dated and we think it won't rent, well enough or get a good enough tenant well we might just pass on it because yeah. you know we're not looking to uh have the best everything but we also know that, like the reality is like mediocre mediocre properties attract mediocre tenants mm. and mediocre tenants don't always pay their rent on time and all that stuff it comes, that's it, a problem yeah <laughs> it, it just spirals out of out of control from there um so then once we'll take a look at it, you know, if, if they need help getting it rent ready, we've got folks who can do carpets, who can do cabinets, who can do all those things. And, you know, we can manage that process for them or they can hire them themselves or they can hire somebody else, you know, whatever they prefer. Uh, then once the place is rent ready, we'll get our, our photographer in there. Photographer takes the photos. We get it listed on you know, all the major sites to, to rent out homes or apartments or, or what have you. How do you do like all that process? Because that's that can't be included in the like monthly thing or is it so it depends like if it's a really nice top of market rental we'll eat the cost of the photos and, and then again not every place warrants professional photos because sometimes like the layout's awkward it's yeah just it's hallways. gonna be hard to make you, it look. you know it's not gonna it's not gonna show well it doesn't matter if you have a, a super fancy dslr or, or you know something a little it's bit a smartphone yeah exactly so uh you know if the place warrants it we'll get the photos uh we're not taking those again we've got a professional photographer who charges us a great rate um, but you basically want to get that unit rented so that you can build, start building the relationship with the client and start your fee right, at that point. Right. So if, if it goes, if we're like showing and advertising and, and pre-screening tenants, we charge one month's rent to, to yeah. place a tenant, which is got to be well, careful. That's probably, standard. that's probably yeah, standard. Yeah. I can't right? call it a standard, but if you call like because I'm licensed realtor, but if you call 10 agents, nine of them are going to tell you. Same thing. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like, it's kind of an unwritten standard, if you will. My wife is a realtor. Um, okay. She doesn't do a ton because yep. we have little kids, but I think I remember her saying that too. Like it's usually like one month's rent to like yeah. put someone in a unit. Yeah. And, and like, it's unfortunate when people call up and like, wow, one month, that's pretty expensive. And I'm like, <laughs> sweetie, you don't even know like that. that It's really just a loss leader to, to, so then, you know, the money's made on the, the monthly management fee. Yeah. Because if we have to show it, let's say 10 times and the property's 30 minutes away. Yeah. So that's an hour every it's time you time. go there. So that's, you know, let's just say you're only getting one show or you're doing 10 rounds of showings or t 10 different tenants or whatever. Thankfully, we don't do that. But, you know, there's 10 hours and then, you know, pre-screening and setting up the showings and going through applications, background checks, credit checks, Facebook checks, everything. We, we run the gamut on these people. Um, I mean, you could be 20, 30, 40 hours into a tenant just to make 900, 1,000, 1,200 dollars. What does that come out to like 40, 20, 40, 50? Like it, it's peanuts compared to. Yeah, yeah. To what it could for be. a business like it's not for a, a business not a ton. right yeah you go tell joe Schmo you can make 40 hours 40 bucks an hour doing it they're, they're all stoked. excited but the reality is like there's insurance and there's gas and there's yeah. you know <laughs> all the stuff that got you to that point to even be able to try exactly and do that exactly dude what i was thinking is like i feel like that is that would be valuable just knowing someone is trying to get like a solid tenant in there right because like I said, like I have a couple multifamilies myself and self manage them. But like I take my time with like figuring mm -hmm. out who's going to go in there because um, the worst feeling in the world, one of the worst feelings in the world, I feel at least for me is like having a crappy relationship with someone that's in my property yeah. and knowing that like there's not a lot I can really do about that, especially right now. Yeah. You know, people who were loose on their screening processes, uh, 
sound a little crude about it, but they got caught with their pants down dur- during COVID. Yeah. You know, if your tenant barely qualified and you didn't catch that before they got into the apartment before COVID and now they're in COVID and they're not paying you rent or they're in, you know, we're in COVID, excuse me, and, and they're not paying rent. I hate to say it, but most of the time it's, it's, it was self done as yeah, yeah. from the landlord. Like you because shot yourself in the you foot. You shot yourself in the foot. Like you knew these are the things that I need to get to get a good tenant. And I'll tell you ours, no evictions, non-smokers, income, net income, three times the rent. Mm. Keep in mind, most people do two and a half gross. Right. Gross doesn't mean anything because you and I both know a $1,500 weekly check gross. thousand bucks, maybe. Becomes a thousand, seven hundred, depending on child support, yeah, health, yeah. 401k, oh, yeah. all that stuff. I mean, think <laughs> about it. You know, 1500 becomes 700 real quick. So instead yeah. of making 15, three, six grand, now you're making three grand. And it's like, okay, <laughs> that's a big difference. Now you got a $600 car payment. You got right. credit card payments, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's like, if there's not enough money at the end of the month, you're, that rent isn't going to get paid. Right. So anyways, I think the, the screening process is, is what sets. Are you big on credit, like credit score? I'm not. I'm no. more, I, I, we run a, a budget for every single tenant that applies. And, you know, as long as your credit isn't whacked out and it's, yeah, yeah. uh, you know, you're, you're steady with your payments. That's one thing. I honestly, we've taken people with no credit and mm. I'm, I'm more okay, honestly, with no credit than I am with someone who has bad credit. And there's yeah, a yeah. difference. And there's people who have like 600s because they're just building credit. Yeah. And there's people who have 600s because they've been in collection six times. Like, right, right. <laughs> there's a big difference. <laughs> um, so credit is less important than their income versus their debts. Mm. And uh, if their income's enough and I can run a budget, you know, if it's a family of four, if it's a family of two, like I know what it costs to, to feed a family of four. Right. I know what it costs to, to heat oh, an so apartment. Oh, so you like do a whole budget. Oh, on yeah. It. I start off, I get your <laughs> net income, get your significant others or roommates net yeah. income, whatever. I add that sucker together. Your phone's this, cable's Cable, this. Yeah. Insurance oh, yeah. average. Uh-huh. And I see your car payment for $700 a month when you're making 2300 a month. And I'm like, what the hell are you doing? Anyways, I, and I look at it and it's like, so do you ask them for all that? Like, oh, yeah, yeah. Do you have a car payment? Do you have It's this? in their credit reports when we run their credit. Gotcha. Yep, and same thing with their income. We, we require the, the most two recent pay stubs. If they're gotcha. self-employed, obviously, it's different. But, right. um, yeah, so we'll look at it, and we'll, we'll back out of it. We'll say, okay, well, if your net income take home is 4000 between the two of you, and then you each got $500 car payments, well, now, really, your net is only at 3000 Right. Because your car payment's got to get paid. Otherwise, your ass isn't going to work, right. <laughs> which means that 4K ain't going to be there. Right. So, anyways, we'll do that. We'll do food. We'll do insurance, utilities, and we'll see, like, oh, there's only $100 at the end of the month. That means they're, like, one flat tire away from having a big problem on their hands, mm-hmm. and a flat tire is not what should set you back for a month. Right. Uh, and if they're at a loss at the end of the month, forget it. Like, that's not, it's not, it doesn't matter. Like, your your net income doesn't matter at that point because you have so many liabilities. Mm-hmm. It's really, like, as if you're qualifying them for a mortgage, you know, your yeah, debt-to-income yeah. ratios. It's you know, just as important. It's, it's just not just as, as regulated, important. I feel. Yep, and you know what? We made it all the way through COVID without a single missed payment. That's awesome. Every single one of our tenants. Because so you know that they're solid. They're solid. And, like, obviously, you know, we inherited a couple of tenants and, and buildings that came on in the last year or so. So, yeah, we'll call it a little bit of luck there, too, if you want. But of of the ones that we have, you know, we didn't miss a single rent payment. And I can't imagine there's too many management companies that are managing 70 <laughs> units that can say that. You know, it's one thing to say, like, yeah, none of my tenants missed rent. You got four tenants. Like, right, right. I, And I'm, don't get me wrong. I'm not talking down to anybody. Yeah, yeah. But it's a lot different when you're doing 50, 60, 100, 200, You have to have some is. processes there, and that's a lot of stuff that you've already been doing. To And the more stuff that you're doing, the more mistakes that are, the more risk that there is. Exactly. You know? Yeah, exactly. The, the more of it that you're doing, the more chances that something goes wrong. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's really easy to get comfortable in the process, too. Have you had to evict anyone yet? Uh, we have never had to evict a tenant we've placed. We had to evict an inherited tenant once. Mm. Tenant once. And we've placed, like, 100, 120 tenants in the last couple of years. Nice. So, yeah, I think uh, I think our, our screening systems are are in good shape by this point. So. That's awesome. Did you come up with it yourself? Yeah. You know, nice. Straight out of bigger pocket, <laughs> straight out of a little bit of experience. A little experience. bit of info here, a little bit of info here. Yeah. And I honestly, the, the number one thing that I can give to anybody 
is look at the net income mm-hmm. because I think a lot of places are preaching like two and a half or three times a gro- gross, and it's like gross doesn't mean anything. Yeah, yeah. And run their budget. Run, see what they're losing every month to, to stupid car payments or to the phone company or, you know, that electricity bill they didn't pay 16 years ago and now pay Eversource <laughs> $24 a month. Like It all adds f- up. Exactly. It all adds up. Find that stuff because that net number between their net income and those monthly expenses, that's what they got to pay the rent with. And it's like, if that number ain't enough, yeah, it, it's not going to look good. Like it's going to, it's not going to be first versus your food. Yeah. Oh, they'll pay car, car payments before they whatever. pay rent every month. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. If they got $600 and the, the rent payment is 700 and the car payment is 600, they're going to pay the car payment <laughs> because a lot of people are more proud about what they drive rather than where they live. Why? Because people see them in their cars. Mm. People don't get seen at their house usually. Yeah. So it's like this whole societal thing right now that we're in with all the, and I'm getting on a tangent here. I'll wind myself back, but <laughs> this whole thing right now with Insta this and snap that it's, killing people it's definitely i mean i definitely even feel it like the uh the pull to want to covet what other people have or like want to be more than you are and some and it's something that honestly so like for me like that's not really like material things like i could care less like about dude i'll dress in like a blank shirt you know what i mean like Shorts, I got it. TJ Maxx or something like that. Like, no problem. Drive stuff that I need. Like, my truck I I use for work. And, like, it makes stuff that makes sense, you know. But for me, it's like, I want, I have, like, this big vision of, like, growing a company and, like, doing all these things and and ultimately changing, like, the world. Like, changing my community for the better. Making a positive impact in the lives of people I come in contact with. But the bigger that you are, the more opportunity that you have to do that. And so, like, I follow all these, like, gurus on social media, you know? like, And some, like, Jocko, like, awesome. Like, tons of value, like, solid principles, this and that. But other ones, like, you know, Grant Cardone, like, (laughs) always flashing it, you know? Always. Looks great. Looks awesome. Like, very desirable for, like, for something like that. So, like, that's where I find, like, social media can be a little bit of a detriment because you're seeing this stuff, their content is them in this amazing place that probably was gotten to for the most part by themselves and like their hard work and their success that they've earned. But um, you're seeing them them at their peak and it's like, I don't know, does something inside your brain. It does. And uh, you have to remind yourself that you're looking at people's highlight reels. Mm -hmm. Nobody's posting the flat tire they got. Nobody's (laughs) posting... You know, the shit, excuse me, the bad review they got at work. Like, nobody's posting the bad things. And, like, I got a couple of family members who are high on that. Let me post my highlight reel on Facebook thing, and I'm not about it. <laughs> so much so, over the last few months, I, I got off Instagram. I was like, you know, I always use it as an excuse. I'm like, yeah, I'm on Instagram for work. Yeah, yeah. And I'm like, wait a second, I haven't posted something to Connecticut Property Management Instagram for, like, the last three months because I've been so busy with other stuff. It's like... You know, let me just put Instagram on the back burner. Delete. <laughs> Deleted Instagram. And it's like, I get it. Super anti, you know, building a brand on, on media, on social right now. And that's fine. I'm willing to take that because I never had somebody come to me like, yeah, I saw you on Instagram and we'd like to work with you. Mm. There's a time and a place for that. My work isn't flashy. Your yeah, work yeah. is flashy, right? Like you can post really beautiful photos of the work, you know, your most recent addition, bathroom, kitchen, whatever. Mm. I can't. Might be able to do a little bit of that for property management, yeah. but, the, but the trade-off wasn't worth it because for me, I got a little bit of an addictive personality. <laughs> it's like when I stayed away from the bear <laughs> and like, I, so it's like, yeah, it's real easy for me to just keep scrolling through Instagram. It's like, how many hours of my life have I lost a because lot. I've scrolled through Instagram? And now transition that I, I realized how great I felt and like two or three weeks later, I'm like, you know what? I don't remember uh, missing so-and-so that I've been watching on Instagram for the last right. year. And it's like, oh, it's been two weeks. You know, my right. life's even better. And it's like, okay, well, what have I done in the time Instead. that I would usually have been on Instagram? And it's like, it's unfortunate because like you don't, you don't realize like, oh yeah, those last 15 minutes I would have been on Instagram, but instead I did this. Mm. But you know, like deep down, it's like, oh, well, that was probably three hours last week that I was working in the business instead of scrolling through my phone. It's like, you just have to know and hear. Yeah, better focus. That. Yeah. Dude, I find that's, that's huge. And, um. Definitely a couple of years ago, like I was wanting to get out of social media myself yeah. because 
I would always say the same thing. Like I am growing the business on there and yeah. this and that, and that's why I'm on it now. But I wanted to get to a place where like I could have other people do that and not have to do it myself right. and then therefore be able to get out of it. Yeah. But it's such a personal thing it is. and it takes so much time that like I kind of made the decision like I can't really do that. I need to. So if I'm going to stay on it, then I might as well just dive right in and like just go for it. You know yeah. what I mean? And now it's the same thing. Like I was telling you about my brother, like in the video and stuff and video is really the way of the future. And totally. I've kind of seen internally, I've seen that for the last like about year and a half and only recently, like the last, I don't know, four months or so have kind of like been able to make that happen. And, um, our, we have a company that does a lot of social media for us do an awesome job. But video takes a lot of time. Yes, it does. A ton of time. Yep. And um, good video isn't cheap either. Not cheap. So it makes it kind of like not uh, conducive. worth it or yeah. conducive to pay someone to do that. Right. So that's why I was like having my, my younger brother like start video for us. He, it was kind of his niche. 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 And, um, and now like I've started doing it myself because to fill that void and still be able to post stuff and it's cool. And I feel like it's definitely necessary. And I guess I do see what you're saying. Like with the, like, I don't know, you want to make what you're doing, like look sexy, you know, right. like have that appeal of like, wow, like that's a really cool thing yeah. that these guys do. Like I want them to come and do it to my house or whatever. And the video is just a way to do that, but it kind of definitely draws you into the whole social media realm and yeah, it's dangerous it's hard to get out of it it's a slippery slope we were doing uh what i called pm tips property management tips mm -hmm. and we would release one every other day or something and like yeah that was pretty good it was it was nice to be able to like give back to people and establish right. just credibility a brand you know it's cutesy all that stuff but then it's like man unless you got people like dedicated to that or like you said your your team like for me at that point, I didn't have that. And it's yeah. like, okay, well let me focus on growing the business to the point that then I can reinvest it into hiring people for that. Like we're still growing without Instagram. So exactly. it's like, uh, you know, I'd rather spend an hour posting on bigger pockets where I know like I'm, I'm putting seeds everywhere You're and getting like, value back. I'm getting value back. And at the same time I'm giving value, which right. is more important. Um, so yeah, for me, like I had to get out of it. And now like even now on Facebook, the uh, I've recently learned about the power of unfollow. So if you click somebody's <laughs> profile and you hit unfollow, they don't get offended because like you're no longer my friend on Facebook. No, <laughs> you know, you hit unfollow and you don't see them in your feed anymore. And it's like, there's some toxic people that you don't need to see in your feed anymore. Yeah. Listen to me, people like you do not need to see that guy in anymore. Like you don't need to see him flashing his, his whatever. Uh, and so do yourself the a favor. Reel. Yeah. You, you this owe is the first it to time yourself. I've heard of that. Heard of that. Before, you owe it to so yourself. True. There's Facebook groups galore. You know, I was in every Indian motorcycle, Nissan Z, you know, Facebook group out there, woodworking groups. Cause I'm, I'm a hobbyist in that too. And it's like, land there's like 20 landlord groups just for connecticut connecticut's tiny you yeah, know yeah. tiny state and there's like 15 landlord groups and i loved being like oh here's what you should do and it's like yes did like people think of me the next time somebody asked hey i need a property manager yes they did absolutely but was it worth it like was i sacrificing too much of my own time hmm. And it's not even like, am I getting anything back? Like, no, it genuinely feels good to help people. But like, you only have 24 hours in a day. Right. So it's like where, like on a Facebook thread, you and I both know, like once it's there, it just gets shuffled lower right. and lower and lower into, into like the abyss. Whereas like, I'd rather spend the time on bigger pockets where it's like, if somebody searches notice to quit Connecticut, they'll see, Hey, Philippe offered this guy a notice to quit. Let me just email him where it's like Facebook, dude, the search function in Facebook garbage it, yeah it's garbage compared to like bigger pockets it's evergreen the information's always out there your name is always on that post hmm. um so i'm just what do you mean evergreen What's evergreen that? in that like it doesn't expire like oh okay if you put it on facebook in like a, a thread or like we respond to somebody's comment to find it the next guy comes up puts a new post now your post is like even lower and then the next guy you know okay your post is even lower hmm. whereas like content that's evergreen like it's always out there you post something on youtube and the guy, the next guy searching for it is going to be able to find it. Right. Whereas like Facebook doesn't have that, that search. It's a different kind of like platform. It's different kind way. of platform and it's a different kind of user mentality too. Like if you go to YouTube, like a how to blah, blah, blah. 
You'll find a lot. Exactly. You're looking for that. Like people don't go to the Facebook forums to say, how do you blah, blah, blah. Or like they don't search that. They say, hey, I need a plumber. Right. They're not, they're not looking for, uh, okay, search the word plumber in Facebook groups. It doesn't Well, you see it all the time of like people will make a new post and they'll say like, yeah, I did search for my old post, but I couldn't find it. Exactly. I'm making a new one. Exactly. Whereas like, you know, if you put in whatever, blah, 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 and then bigger pockets on the Google search function, it'll pull up all the bigger pockets threads. So Mm. it's like that, that is evergreen because it it never goes away. Hmm. Yeah. That's a good, that's a good term. (laughs) <laughs> there's two so we got a uh, highlight reel and evergreen <laughs> hope you guys are taking notes <laughs> so dude so i was i was telling you about since we're on the topic of facebook sure i was telling you how i had seen like your uh progress for yes. like some kind of goal so tell us tell me about that yeah so shout out to david haberfield on this one Do you know david haberfield i know him from facebook i yeah, don't know there him you go. Personally. me too i think i met the guy once <laughs> um so David Haverfield, the years back, posted his, t- like, 2018 goals or whatever it was. Huh. And I was like, oh, I should start making goals. And then I made goals, and it kind of worked. And then I was like, let me post them on Facebook like David does. And I posted them on Facebook, and then I uh, did quarterly updates. And, you know, for my exercise one, one of my goals is uh, exercise 150 times. Nice. This year. Um, or 180. I don't even know anymore. But uh, posting it on Facebook allowed me to... Uh, have be, accountability be accountable to to whoever was liking and following and yeah, whatever yeah. and it's funny because like my plumber got on the phone with me like halfway through last year and he's like how's your goals you're gonna get there and i'm like holy <laughs> shit <laughs> he's watching <laughs> so it's just it, everyone's you know watching, everyone's watching everyone's <laughs> watching it's just a fun little thing and it's like yeah, it matters at the end of the day because like you do want to reach your goals right that's why right. you set them you know you set them so that you can stretch a little bit but uh but you want to be able to, to to achieve them so yeah, so I, I post on on Facebook quarterly. You know, here's my goals. Here's where I'm at, and uh, you never know. Like, you never know who also has a similar goal, right? Where now it's like, oh great, now you got an accountability partner, like right. a direct accountability partner. And um, I've had people reach out to me just because of those goals that like wouldn't have reached out to me otherwise. For sure. And like, oh, you know, not even like just like you know you're motivating me to make my own, like my little cousin, my 17 year old cousin. <laughs> she's like, yeah, I see you're doing awesome on your running goal. You know, I'm going to start doing that too. And I'm like, hell yeah. yeah like, yeah. there you go. Like, cause my thing, one of my life missions is to, to leave people better than I found them. Mm. Like I want to create generational change in my family. And what does that mean? It can mean a, a variety of things. It could be financial. It could be spiritual. It could be just being a better person. Right. But like, to be able to impact my cousins in ways that uh, other people haven't or other yeah. people might just not be able to is awesome. Right. So like, one of my, like, I've been telling my cousins since they're like 15 or 16 years old to get a Roth IRA. And I got six cousins under the age of 22, and four of them have Roth IRAs already. Nice, dude. So it's like, all right, cool. Like, <laughs> And I tell them, like, just keep putting that 5000 6000 a year. You'll be a millionaire by the time you retire. And they're like, what? And I'm like, yeah. And, like, their parents don't know that. Mm. And it's like, now I could potentially be changing their family trees and their kids' kids' family trees because now they know what a Roth IRA is. They're going to tell their kids. Yeah. You know, and guess what? When they have kids, I'm going to be telling them about 529 plans for their col- kids' colleges. So it's like stuff like that where it's like, Nobody taught me this. I, mm. I learned that stuff myself. And now it's like, I have this knowledge in my head and it's like, I could change everybody like around me by just telling them this and being an example. And it's like that transition to goals. And yeah, that's, that's dude, that's awesome. The, uh, it's honestly like motivating because that is, I feel like we have a very similar mentality yeah. in these kind of ways, because like I was saying, like one of my life's missions is to change my corner of the world for the better. And that kind of like goes into our company mission, which is to um, change the contracting industry for the better and to positively impact the lives of everyone we come in contact with. Right. Um, I'm also like very big on uh, six, like achieving or like striving for success in all aspects of my life and pushing for that for everyone around me. So like yeah. financial success, physical success, family success, spiritual success, mental success, like those are pretty much the five like main things that I kind of focus on. And that's going to be different for each person out there, but it's just something to think about. You know what I mean? Like I want to be better in all those aspects of my life than I was yesterday or or this year than I was last year. 
And you saying that, like that, uh, you want to be able to like use the knowledge that's in your head to better the lot, like the lives of your family or create generational change is huge. And it honestly is very motivating to me because it's something that like, I don't know that I've been forgetting to do, Mm. but like, it brings it forefront of mind, like yeah, the Roth a, IRA. Like I have a Roth IRA. I've been putting money in there since right. I don't know. I was like nineteen or something exactly. like Me that. Me too. Yeah, but I haven't told anyone else to like. It's a conscious make one, decision you know? that you have to take. <laughs> Seriously though, because think about it, and like that would be so easy because, you know, when they do retire and they have grandkids, because you're going to retire, you know, whatever sixty, sixty five, and you might have a grandkid by then. You know, you're going to tell your kid, and they're going to tell their kid, like, hey, this is how Papa got to become a millionaire right. when he retired. Right. And then they're going to be like, wait, who, who started this in our family? And I'm going to be like, yeah, <laughs> that guy, I did. <laughs> it's like, Believe. yeah, yeah, yeah. So it's like, that's the kind of thing where it's like, you know, and how easy is it to just like keep hammering at a 16 year old to get a Roth IRA? Like it, it doesn't take any effort for my like, Hey, want, you know, we got together Christmas, Easter, new year or whatever. Did you get your IRA you get set your, up yet? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. You're joking, <laughs> but I'm serious. Like, and, and it'll work, you know, I got four of them. The other two are, are under 18. So it's a little bit tougher under 19, but all four that are, are working are, uh, are in the Roth IRA program. So what do you tell them? Just like go to your bank and sell one up or you have a place. I coach them through it. I'll get on vanguard.com with them right now. If I have to like, here, here, let's do it. Let's do it together. <laughs> <laughs> I'll WhatsApp you. We'll do it on the computer computer whatever it takes because at the end of the day like and this was one of my longer facebook rants recently or not rants but but posts where it's like um you know i don't want people to remember me for like the cars i have or the houses i have or how big this business gets or or the money that i have i want them to remember like yeah i'm doing this differently right now because philippe showed me this or told me this Mm. 10 15 20 30 years ago right like that that to me is how you measure change like don't go to my funeral and be like, yeah, that guy had a six Z. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I might have a nice Z, but like, that, don't do that. I want you to remember like, oh no, like I'm this much better in my life because, oh, Philippe taught me how to uh, give notice to vacate to a tenant or Philippe taught me how to set up a Roth IRA and like, yeah, yeah. you know, that kind of stuff because You're planting the seeds everywhere. Yeah, exactly. And like all aspects of my life as much as I can, like that's, that's how you, I think, create change. It's, it's like actual tangible things like information that, people wouldn't have if they didn't cross paths with you. Mm. So, Dude, honestly, thank you. Yeah. Because uh, like I was saying, like that's something that has been like, bi- I was really big on, but like I haven't been for a while. And I, there's any ex- any number of, of excuses of why, right, you know, right. but I do have a lot going on in my life, but it doesn't mean that you can't weave that into conversation. And oh, totally. That's something that, uh, like I was saying, I was like, really, I have been really big on and I preach a lot about like in terms of like what I say is my values is like passing information on and like making people around me better, positively right. impacting them. But unless you're actually doing it, what is it? It's just words. You know what yeah. I mean? So yeah, that's, a sim- that's a simple way to yeah, I mean, help people it, out. And even your guys, like I think you said you had 14 guys on, on or employees right now. It's like, yeah. You know, the next employee meeting, like, hey, guys, just want to make sure you guys are taking care of your future selves. Have yeah. you thought about investing in a Roth IRA? And it's like, you know, it, you doing it versus like uh, a Vanguard or a... Uh, Somebody trying to sell them on it. Trying to sell them on it. It's different. Yeah. Um, it's, it's much different because you come off as caring for, and you don't benefit from them doing a no. Roth IRA. Like, I'm not talking about a 401k. Like, just, you know, but it's like, think about it. If they, in 30 years when they retire, have a half mil in the bank because their boss their supervisor Dude, told them something that I've found with that is like you really because I I mean you can ask some of the guys that have been with me for years um yeah. Joe's been with me since 2016 bunch of other guys have been like three years four years that kind of thing but you can ask them like if you ever meet them or whatever sure. how things were back then and when it's a smaller group it's a lot easier to do that but what I'm finding now is like as things grow totally if people don't have ears to hear, you can't, you can't give it to them yeah. anymore, you know? So yeah. like, I'll try to, and you also can't, you have to like watch what the context of the conversation is too. Cause people sure. aren't always going to just jump on it, you know, um, just because you said something out of the blue, you know? So what I've been trying to do is just kind of like plant the little seeds, like, Hey, like I have a pretty good like financial background. Like if you want to like have, have a beer, have a coffee, like sit yeah, down and chat about this, available. I will definitely love to share some, some knowledge that I've learned like through my own experiences and the hard way sometimes and like through other things that I've learned from other people. 
But unless someone's willing to do that, it kind of falls on deaf ears sometimes, yeah. I find. And it's tough, too, because, like, you it's a fine line, right? Because at 28, to tell a 21-year-old my cousin's age, like, this is what you should be doing. And it's like, yeah. for them to not hear that from their parents who are perceived to have the credibility that, you know, comes with giving financial advice, like, it's different. You know, you don't expect to get that from from a 28 year old or from your cousin, right? You expect yeah, to yeah. get that from your parents. Um, and uh, like s- full circle here, like bringing that back to property management, it's tough to like tell a, a client who just purchased a building for four or 500,000, whatever, 300,000 it is to then hand it off to like a 20 something year old. Like, yeah. yeah, you're going to manage. Take care it. of this. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Yeah. I'm, you know, I'm in Seattle. I just dumped a ton of money in there. Yeah. My <laughs> first client was from Seattle, Washington. Never met me. Found me on bigger pockets, bought a house, sight man. unseen. Okay, bought the house, sat on team, flew out for the inspection. Wow. And I was 24 at the time. And, and like, how, like it's it's difficult to build. Now, you know, we're established. It's different. Yeah, yeah. But back then, it's like, how do you build credibility at such a young age? And I imagine in, in your shoes or your situation, it's it's off, awfully similar, right? Because barring, you know, if they know you, it's different, obviously. Yeah, yeah. But, like, you come in at 31 versus the contractor who comes in at 61, who do you think has done more jobs? Probably the guy who's 61. Right. Yeah, he's got 30 years on you, right? <laughs> so, like, that's my favorite thing when people say, like, how long have you been in business? And I'm like, well, I'm 28, so I can't tell you I've been in business for 20 years. <laughs> but I pretty much started as soon as I could when I graduated yeah, yeah. from college. So, you know, take that with, with whatever you will. But, you know, it's it can be tough. I imagine. Dude, I think it has to do with a lot a lot with our confidence yeah, and how we I perceive agree. ourselves. Like, totally agree. I have no problem now walking into it, like, because there was a couple times where I'd go look at jobs when I first started and yeah. I'd walk into a room with like four other contractors yep. that are all older than me. They're having, yep. the homeowners having everyone come at once, which is freaking awkward for one thing. Yeah. But now I would have no problem walking into a room full of contractors, even if they knew me or didn't know me or right. whoever, and having full confidence that I'm going to give as good or a better job and experience than any of them ever could to that client and being able to back up like that confidence with the experience and the knowledge that I have, even though I don't have 30 years of experience, I have seven years of experience in business and like 12, 13 years of experience in the trade. You know what I mean? So that's not a lot of time compared to these other guys, but it matters how quickly you learn Mm. what the information is that you need to know and how quickly you can dissect that experience and reuse it in your life. Yes. And grow from that. Yes. And I've had an extremely fast and high growth path, which has enabled me to have that confidence to walk into that room. Yeah, absolutely. And and there's going to be times where you stumble and then it's like mull over that, lose yeah. that. And this is for people who are, are more on the self-employed path. But like take that loss but then, like, give yourself time to, to chew through it fine. Right. You know, whatever. But it doesn't need to be a week. It yeah. doesn't need to be 60 seconds, but it doesn't need <laughs> to be a week. So, you know, f- get over it, and then it's like, okay, what can I learn from this? Exactly. Because L can stand for a loss, or it can stand for a lesson. Right. So take that. Dude, that's huge. Yeah. Take that. I'm going to steal that one. For yeah. Sure. I just came up with it on the spot. So <laughs> just came out right off the dome. Uh, <laughs> but take that and, like, okay, what process, what system could I have had in place that would have prevented this outcome. Right. And guess what? If you put that system or that process in place, you're not going to have that outcome. Exactly. In the It'll be for a different reason, maybe. <laughs> but for it, the same reason won't won't duplicate itself, Dude, which is all you can ask for in business. I feel like the um, the times where I make a mistake or I have a loss or something bad happens. Yep are so much more valuable than the times where you're just winning yeah, it or just you're goes buttery running smooth. along, you know, yeah. because a lot of times things do go smooth and that's great. You need that recovery time for like right. mental space yeah. and all of that. Totally. But like when you do have those problems, when you do get stressed out, when you do get pushed to your limit, yeah. whether that's mentally, whether that's with the team, whether that's with a client, whatever it is, those are the times where you're going to experience the growth. And it takes like someone with the right mindset to think about it that way. Cause right. a lot of people like, hit that loss or hit that wall and this they isn't don't, for me exactly maybe i should do something else big downer yeah. you know what i mean yeah, and yeah. and that is valid you know because it does no one likes to lose no right. one likes to have the bad experience but it's also not conducive to getting better and for anyone who has the mindset of like 
growth or self-development or anything like that, like those losses are what is going to make you get better. They're where you're going to find that growth, where you're going to get to the yeah. next level. And your clients never want to hear you say this, but like a little bit of stumbling here and there is, is good. Yeah. You know, it means that you're being put into new challenging situations. It means that like, that you're going to be able to give them a better experience based off of those, ex- those quote unquote negative experiences. Yeah. I had one recently come up where we didn't, we didn't collect the reserve. So usually when we send a new client on, we collect the reserves up front, which is like a cushion account. You yeah, know, yeah. If there's an emergency or, you know, a big expense or whatever, we always have a thousand dollars per property. Yeah. Just in case. Uh, and we run that separate from like the operating account. Well, we didn't collect that thousand dollars because it was something that was like, oh, we'll just take it from the cash flow from, you know, the first few months and we'll pad up that thousand dollars over the next few months. What he failed to tell me was that he had like hundreds of, if not like thousands of unpaid bills. So the cash flow coming in was paying those bills that were already huh. in place before he hired us. He's like, oh, I forgot to give you this bill. Here you go. Sends me an email. And it was like a seven hundred dollar bill. So, so the thousand dollar reserves never got built. Then I needed money, and it's like, it's like, what do you need money for? Anyways, had we just followed the process of collecting Gotten the thousand dollars, this is like from one of your clients. Yes, gotcha. exactly. And it, so, like, you put that in a separate contingency fund. Exactly. If anything comes up, you just pay it out of that, exactly. and then he can reimburse yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Or we just gotcha. reimburse it from the cash flow. So it it ultimately ended up in like a failure of the relationship. Because now, uh, you know, everything's becoming contentious. It's like, well, I think it's about the money. And then he's like, well, it's not about the money. I'm like, mm, it's about the money. <laughs> you know, it's just like, whatever. So, but now I don't take on management until we have a signed contract, signed W9. That's like your deposit and the check. Sign, and the $1,000. Exactly. Yeah. This whole like, oh, we'll just pay into it over the first few months. Uh-uh. Not anymore. <laughs> you don't know what you're going to walk into. You don't know what you don't know. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's definitely, I mean, there's definitely some stories I could share with similar things, you yeah. know, and you learn and you change how you do things slightly. Right. And, and like, it was a big client. So it's like, you know, you want to get that job so bad right. you start to like bend. Dude, your sometimes policies. it's kind of like a little bit of like a covering of the eyes. Absolutely. So Absolutely. juicy. And you're like, oh man, like I need to make this work, you know? Yep. yep. And those are the ones that bite you. It was a yeah. marine too. So, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, still active. <laughs> so, good thing you're not marine. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's. I mean, that's not really a. Um, that's not really a. Uh, like a, a military kind of thing is more of a character type yeah. trait. You know, I agree. there's all types in any walk of life. Yep. And it really depends on what their values are and what their principles are and how they're going to act in their own life because of those. Yeah. Absolutely. Right on. Totally agree. Doesn't matter. Color, <laughs> uh, wealth status. Yeah. You know, I tell people all the time, they're like, uh, you know, I don't really want a section 810. I'm like, well, first of all, it's illegal. Second of all, I've got good rich people. I've got bad rich people in terms of like tenant income. And I've got good section 8 tenants and I've got not so good section 8 tenants. Yeah. Doesn't matter. I think it's more of like, yes, it is illegal to say like, I don't want a, se- a section 8 tenant right, or whatever. Right. But I think it's more of like a, a preference thing because I know in my head, like when I think of Section 8, I think of like a lower grade sure. tenant. You yep. know what I mean? So like I'd much rather qualify somebody that has their own income and is be- going to be a better tenant ultimately for me um, because people that have those kind of assistance programs and stuff, like they're depending on that money to be able to pay their rent or whatever. And I don't know. But on the, I guess on the flip side, like you are guaranteed a portion of your rent. So, yeah. So here's what I'll say about that without, you know, getting myself into hot water here. Um, I have two Section 8 tenants right now off the top of my head that without even like telling them that we're going to come by to just say hello, their apartment would look like a museum. Like mm. everything like perfect, nice. clean, orderly. And they got kids. And nice. So, you know, you have They're kids. Work you in. know how it is. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. And, and, like, these are people who, like, hard times, you know, maybe had a significant other that's no longer in the picture, and now they're down to one income. Then you got other people, which is what ruins it for the good tenants. You got other people who are just gaming the system. Mm. You know, they're Section 8 tenants, and they get X amount from the government as housing aid, but their lifestyle 
is that of someone who makes 10 times what they make. Like really? some section eight tenants have nicer cars than I do. And it's like, wow. wait, wait a second. So it's like, <laughs> and that's what ruins it for the people who actually need it. And yeah, yeah. there's David Haberfield has a long list of, of ways to fix the section eight program. And I largely agree with him, but as with most government things, <laughs> it's uh, years to make it. And then even more years to undo the, the things that are wrong with it. But mm. no, I, you know, we'll, we'll consider anybody, as long as you meet our basic criteria. And hmm. So, yeah. Cool, man. What time is it? It is 5.33. We should probably end this thing. I think so. <laughs> but we'll have to do another one, dude. Absolutely. It's been fun. Thanks so much. Do you have anything else you want to say? No. I, if anybody has any questions regarding to uh, property management, landlording, always giving out free advice, call us, text us, email us. Our website's wemanagect.com. Connecticut Property Management. Love there it. There you go. Philippe, it's been a pleasure. Thanks so much, man. man. Thank you very much.